In the mid to late 1970s, when I was training to be a family doctor, I was very concerned about what I was reading in the papers and, on, and seeing on television about all the adolescent drug abuse, a lot of smoking and drinking and other drugs. And uh, what I wanted to do was to see if we could do something different about that. And I really have had the privilege to go all over the United States and talk about this. As a lady introducing me at the Beaumont, Texas Rotary Club said, Dr. Blum has been invited to lecture in more than 50 states. Well, I mean, there are only 50 states, but uh, she thought I was asked to go all over. And I mean, I guess Puerto Rico and Washington, D.C. would be more than 50 states. And one thing I've learned, and, and um, I've seen this all over the United States, especially a few years ago, is that seven, eight, nine, ten-year-old kids had stopped eating eggs. Just the egg consumption among kids was going way, way, way down. And this is amazing to me. I couldn't figure this out for a while. And I'd heard these anecdotal reports, oh no, they, they weren't eating eggs. And I figured, was this cholesterol? No, that wasn't it. Was it salmonella, the bacteria that was in eggs? No, that wasn't it either. Was it, uh, some kid once said, the, the shells are too crunchy? But no, that, that's, that's not right. And, and um, the parents are off to work, so there's no convenience and so forth. The fact of the matter is, the reason why seven, eight, nine, ten-year-olds stopped eating eggs about uh, five, six years ago in the early 1990s was, this is your eggs, this is your frying pan, this is your brains, this is your brains and drugs on frying pans. And, and these were these commercials that were on TV. Well, this is your brains and this is your drugs and this is your eggs and drugs on brains. And I didn't have any idea. And those were the commercials that everyone saw that were aimed at trying to discourage kids from using drugs. But the kids saw the ads, they saw this is your brains, this is your eggs, this is fried, and oh my God, eggs are drugs. So the kids stopped eating eggs. And I couldn't believe it. And, and then I was thinking, who made these commercials? They were the partnership for an egg-free, no, partnership for a drug-free America, actually. And, and I was thinking, now, who could that be? And I looked it up, who the partnership for a drug-free America was. Could I join? No. The reason why was that this was the advertising agencies for Anheuser-Busch, makers of Budweiser, Miller Beer, makers of Miller Beer, Philip Morris, makers of Marlboro, Johnson & Johnson, makers of Tylenol, so that every child growing up in the United States wouldn't believe that a pill, a beer, or a cigarette was really a drug. So everybody's got to go after cocaine and, and heroin and marijuana. Well, those are very important. But cocaine, marijuana, heroin, and all illegal drugs combined don't kill a tenth as many as cigarette smoking and probably not a fifth as many as alcohol. Tobacco and alcohol combined are far and away the most devastating problems in our society in terms of death and disease. And we're not just talking about drunk driving. We're not just talking about emphysema. We're talking about fire deaths. We're talking about premature infants from parents who smoked and drank. So we're talking about a great deal of problems that we sort of lightly look at and say, oh, well, she smokes or he smokes. Well, too bad. Get him some patches. These are very, very serious problems that take a lot of economic and emotional toll on our society. So I really wanted to do something about it. One of the things that I did was become editor of a journal. It was called the, the New York State Journal of Medicine. And we produced the very first issue of any medical journal in the world devoted entirely to looking at the world tobacco pandemic. We didn't just talk about how bad smoking was, however. We talked about the efforts by the tobacco companies all over the world to aim at people in their own countries, to get into the kind of cultural uh, local, uh, localities that, that people were, uh, were familiar with, their own lo local customs. Here we are in Greece, in France, in uh, New Guinea, in Ireland. And I wrote to medical colleagues all over the world and they wrote back that the picture was just as dismal as it was here. In fact, even worse, because there were virtually no restrictions on how these companies could operate. The problem was, very few people read that. 40,000 doctors got the journal. And um, we made one into a book called The Cigarette Underworld. Not too many people bought it, so I have all the remainders if you'd like to send for a copy. The fact is that people aren't reading old medical journals. They're reading other kinds of journals, like, uh, well, like this one the Weekly World News. 
Now, I mean, I read the Weekly World. I've been reading this for about 15 years, which partly explains why I act this way. But the fact of the matter is, here's a typical headline, Space Alien Meets with Newt Gingrich. Now, that's not news, but, uh, you know, the fact is that um, we've got the Star and the Inquirer and the Examiner. And what do we have in the Oprah? The psychic puppy foretells Oprah's future or how, how much mayonnaise you eat reveals your personality or um, mummy found with artificial heart, crazy stories like that. But what we don't see is the real story on the back covers because apart from the advertising for the horoscopes and the prostate rejuvenators and the, the bus developers are the only ads for their major products, cigarettes, week in and week out, week in and week out. And always with that little warning at the bottom there, well, I know you're saying, well, gee, you know, everybody knows about cigarette advertising, but that doesn't really get people to smoke. Well, these go to 20 million people a week. A lot of people don't read U.S. News. Uh, you, you, a lot of people don't read the Inquirer or the Star or the Examiner. They might be reading U.S. News and World Report, which has an article, How to Reverse Heart Disease. Well, let's just take a look at that one. And there's not too much that they're going to talk about when the back cover is for the leading cause of heart disease, Marlboro. And we're talking about Newsweek, which talks about tuberculosis, it's back, and on the back cover, advertising Carlton cigarettes. And Sports Illustrated, what fell out of here was an eight-page ad for Marlboro racing cars. They say, oh, no, that's not Marlboro cigarettes, that's Marlboro racing cars. And that's really the problem. We're looking at an industry that gets everywhere. Here is New Woman or Field and Stream. Not too many guys read New Woman, not too many women read Field and Stream. But they have in common something very important. The number one advertiser is also the number one preventable cause of death and disease. And the number one preventable cause of death and disease in the United States is not nicotine, not smoking, not lung cancer or heart disease. The number one preventable cause of death and disease in our society is Marlboro. So we're looking at an industry that gets everywhere we are. And in fact, uh, here is a, a TV guide or a glamour magazine, or an entertainment tonight, or popular mechanics, or here's Time magazine, and here's a man's magazine to go with the glamour. Here's Esquire and um, Newsweek. Oh, I shouldn't do this, but here's Playboy, and here is Sports Afield, and U.S. News and World Report, and Hot Rod, and Hunting, and Motor Trend, and Motorcyclist, and Life magazine, and what could they all have in common? All of these men's and women's and entertainment magazines, what they all have in common is that the number one advertiser is also the leading preventable cause of death and disease in our society, Marlboro. So what can you do about that? What you can do really is to be seditious, to sort of strike back. And in the group that I started called DOC, we, uh, we do a little uh, sabotage. For instance, uh, the other day I was on Continental Airlines and you know how you go in an airline and they say, sir, would you like a magazine? So uh, I took this one. And here is a, a typical magazine. It's L Magazine, a fashion magazine. And it's got your usual Marlboro ad on the back cover. So I took out one of my stickers that has a, a Marlboro guy on the, on the sticker with a slash going through him. And it says, many of the ads in this publication are misleading, deceptive, and a ripoff. For example, smoking doesn't make you glamorous, macho, successful, or athletic. It does make you sick, poor, and dead. And we take that like that. And we slap that right across or kiss her, and this is what you get. You get a way to challenge the way in which the advertisers aim at us. And we don't censor anything, but you haven't lived until you've gone into a junior high school or a senior high school and gone in that school library and brought those magazines out for the auditorium to see in the assembly and slap those on and give them to the kids to slap them on too. Because they get a chance to laugh at authority. We don't want to censor. We want to laugh back at the pushers, the real authority figures, not parents or teachers or doctors, the real authority figures in the advertisements. What I'd like to do is to take you through kind of a rapid fire look at how tobacco and alcohol have been promoted to, to generations of people and um, really how we've been able to look at that and feel very frustrated, but maybe offer you a little bit of hope about what we could be doing if we put our thinking cap on and we put a little bit of a laugh on our face and try to laugh these pushers out of town. So this first image uh, of uh, a sign 
is what I call what America means to me. There it is, beer, cigs, video, food. I used to see this going out to Hobby Airport in Houston, and, and, and I thought, wow, this, was, this says it all. This is what an average 12-year-old sees in terms of messages day in and day out in order. Beer, cigs, video, food. It, I once saw a cartoon that said, uh, uh, with a kid saying to his father, say, Pop, is there some kind of law that says you've got to be an athlete to be in a beer commercial? Just think about that, how we've associated sports and drinking and how every teenager grows up thinking that that's supposed to be what you're supposed to be doing with all these fraternity parties and after the football games and so forth. That's become an association, like the tailgating parties and so forth. Thinking of alcohol and football as if that's made for each other. Somebody said to me, what, what happened to sex? Well, that's in the videos. So the fact is that we're looking at what kids are seeing every day, day in and day out in the mass media. But let's go back oh, maybe about 75, 80 years. And um, what we'd like to do is um, see what it was like with um, the, uh, uh, the, the motoring. Of, so I'm, I'm sorry, can I just break here? Because I don't have a way to advance the slides. I apologize. And I'm going to have to figure out how we're going to, we didn't work out the signal. I see. I, I didn't see. I, I apologize to that. So. Um, didn't mind editing that out. That's OK. okay. Um, let's go back about 75 or 80 years to when motoring was just coming into vogue. And people had to get dressed up in their motor costume. And, and how would you like to have someone driving you around saying, oh, one moment, I forgot my whiskey. Here it is. When motoring, go with a good spirit, banquet whiskey. Well, that's absurd. They'd never get away with that today. Or could they? the Budweiser 200 mile per hour race car, watching the Winston Cup races over the weekend, you see the, the Bush series and you see all the Bud cars and, and uh, it's amazing how no one seems to say, well, wait a minute, I thought we're not supposed to be encouraging drinking and driving and yet these guys are speeding around like that. It sort of might send a mixed message to the next generation. Oh, but Anheuser-Busch, the makers of Budweiser say, oh, no, 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 we want you to drink. We, we want you to drink, drink, drink responsibly. See, this is from the division of adverbs. And we want you to drink safely. That's another one that they do. Because they're, they're really concerned about you. Because what they're doing is trying to get across the notion that it's just drinking and driving. That's the only problem. Or how about Miller saying, think when you drink. Now, I mean, the guy obviously, you can't think when you drink. The guy didn't even know where he put his clothes. So, you know, the fact of the matter is, it's, it's not like people are being tuned in to what's really going on here. They're pretending to offer teenagers a message of moderation and thinking when they're drinking and so forth, but it's just really another beer commercial. What, what are some of the other favorites? Uh, after three, give up the key, and um, something when you graduate, designate, or, um, and, and uh, friends don't let friends drive drunk. But, you know, the, well, the simplest one of all, don't drink and, no, don't drink and barf. How about that one? Because I think that would really say it all. I mean, if this is what, what we were exposing teenagers and high school and college students to, I think they might get the message. You know, it's barfing that you do when you drink. You don't sit there and, and have happy times. You know, the headache starts rolling in after about a half an hour. And then a little later and a little later, you start feeling nauseated. And then you head for the bathroom. That's why they always have a lot of bathrooms and bars. And, um, so, you know, you're talking about don't drink and talk stupid, you know, or don't drink and fall down. Or my favorite would be don't drink and do a swirly. You know, the swirl is when you have your head right down in the toilet and it's swirling all around and you're barfing and so forth. So that's what we really need to be saying. We've really got to go after people with a little bit of humor. But unfortunately, here we have the Budweiser athlete. I mean, this is so crazy. He's seeing, what would you say, about 15 footballs about now. There's no way that anybody is going to be able to drink and play sports. There's zero way. But that's not what the commercials tell you. And what's that event in January where everybody stays home and watches that they, on a Sunday afternoon, the whole city is deserted? Well, naturally, it's the Bud Bowl. You see, because that's what people think is so cool. Oh, these beer bottles smashing into one another. It's crazy. Glass flying all over. And this is what people think is cool. No, this is stupid. But no one wants to say, hey, that is so dumb. That is so stupid. But nobody wants to say the emperor's not wearing any clothes. And I've been to high schools where everybody yells out Bud Bowl. 
because they've been programmed to think this is cool. Or how about bring your family together with alcohol? I mean, this is actually from a, uh, from a, a family reunion. It, it, uh, it, it's just crazy. It doesn't make any sense. And uh, a family reunion for Miller Lite. I mean, it just, they sponsor a lot of African-American family reunions, but this is not a way to bring your family together. This is a way to destroy your family. Or how about the, um, for all those bottles she gave you, happy Mother's Day, Mom. I mean, I don't know anybody who's going to give their mom a bottle of booze for Mother's Day. But this is what we see now. We see alcohol being associated with everything. And if you give your mom a bottle of booze, be sure to give her a picture of her liver. Because this is cirrhosis. This is that wonderful harvest time color of the leaves turning brown and, 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 and so forth. And this is, always reminds me, in fact, of the Halloween pumpkins for Budweiser because it's that same kind of orangey, sickly, sickly kind of color. But this is what we don't see when you see those commercials for I want to drink your bud and Elvira, the ghoul of your dreams. The kids are being exposed to alcohol ads that make it seem as this is just another party, another wonderful, happy time. Meanwhile, we're blaming peer pressure and parents but we don't ever talk about propaganda. Now, is this peer pressure, E.T., dressed as a bartender, saying, if you go beyond your limit, please don't drive, phone home? I mean, it's, it's certainly another way to pretend that they're on your side, but how do you know you've reached your limit? When you're too drunk, I mean, you're, it's, it's always up to the individual to know when he or she is too drunk, and that's not a standard. It should be a standard ahead of the drinking that we ought to know about, and not when someone's drunk. Or what about another famous uh, peer pressure type of thing? That's really peer pressure. That's a cartoon character advertised on millions and millions of signs in stores and on billboards and in magazines all over the United States and, and around the world, the cartoon camel. But not even a word of writing on it. It's all image and it's all frequency of messages. That's not peer pressure. And this whole notion of going out to sporting events like the drag races in Baytown, Texas, and, and seeing the Winston drag races where, believe it or not, the ambulance says, just say no to drugs, right underneath the Winston and Budweiser signs. Because they don't want you to appreciate that cigarettes and beer kill 10 times as many people as all the illegal drugs combined. Or what about the Marlboro Man? Now, this was an ad I shot in, in, in Calle Ocho in Miami, Florida, you could see the, this picture for about a mile, and, and you get right up close to it, and you can barely even see the warning label at the bottom of the ad. But what do you do about it? People say, well, let's ban that. I'm not so certain we need to do that, because look what happens when you ban that. You get that. The city of Homestead wanted that race, the Marlboro race, because they thought that that would be a very important thing to have with all that hurricane devastation. So they begged the people at Marlboro to come on in. And it's not going to be so easy to ban things that we don't like. And I'm not so certain that would be a very good thing either. Because once you see that, then it just is a step to just getting the color red. When I did a study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine on the Marlboro Grand Prix and how many times you could see the mentions of Marlboro in a single auto race, 90 minutes, the red and the white logos on the driver's uniforms, on the cars, on the billboards, over 5,000 mentions of Marlboro in 90 minutes, the wonderful folks at the Heart, Lung, and Cancer Societies petitioned the government to put warning labels on the race cars. You know, zoom, you know, 190 miles an hour, you can't see anything other than that color. And that's all you need to remember because red and white is Marlboro. It's like the Crips and the Bloods. It's all colors. Cool is green, Salem is green, Winston is red, Marlboro is red. But they're different kinds of red. Now, when advertising was banned in Africa, this was in the Sudan, this is a week after the cigarette ads were banned in that country. The Philip Morris companies, makers of Marlboro, said, hey, how would you like a new paint job? And that's what they did to all the stores that sold their cigarettes. So they created the entire store as the advertisement. There's not much way that we can ban advertising. They can always stay ahead of the game. Here's a young lady I saw in England. I asked her if I could take her picture. She wondered why I asked her to turn around. But this is what you see. It's called Marlboro gear, adventure gear. And it's get them while they're young, youth marketing. And I think this is the tragedy. We don't realize when we turn on television to see the Skull Bandit race team. That's the spitting tobacco. That's one of the fastest drugs of addiction I've ever seen. It's growing rapidly now in Texas and elsewhere. 
And what you won't see is 19-year-old Sean Marcy, who is a track star in Oklahoma, and who after seven years of using Copenhagen spitting tobacco, developed an oral cancer, very much like this, and died of an oral cancer at just age 19. But, oh, well, we don't want to watch that. I mean, when I show this in schools, the kids don't want to see this. Oh, that's gross. Take it off. They just want to see the Skull Bandit race car, because that's cool. And I think that what we need to get into is to look at these images all over society and see Iman, the model. Oh, she's not going to wear a cigarette. She's just going to, she's not going to smoke. She's just going to wear it because it's part of her looks. And this is a very important, frightening thing that we're just looking at people's outside looks. Now, if you look closely at her mouth, you might just see what's inside. It's called nicotinic stomatitis. That's what we don't see on the insides of people's mouths who smoke. Or how about the premature babies that are born to parents who smoke? And it's just frightening to think that we really are not doing enough about it. Now, do we want to blame the mother? Or do we want to say, oh, that's her denial? No. And my challenge is that it's all of our denial that the medical and other health professions could have been doing so much more on this issue and really can be doing a lot more today, and we're not. We'll be taking a break right now and coming right back and seeing what we could really do about this issue to laugh the pushers out of town. Okay. That was 18 minutes from when you started. Yes, sir. Okay. Got about a minute and a half, Dr. Bell. All right. Okay. Yeah. Oops. Drop everything. Oh. Getting thirsty? No. Mm -hmm. Getting a little warm. Oh, no. Fine. <laughs> I need to see what the next slide is there, so I... Okay, we'll go back then. You want to stay at the caution denial at work, um, sure. Okay, we've got about 30 seconds. Stand by. There's really so much that we could be doing in the clinic, in the classroom, in the community at large. But I think the problem is that everybody thinks that they know all about smoking. It's one of the intellectually easiest issues that you can possibly deal with. There's not a child over the age of two that hasn't heard that smoking is dangerous to his health. And that's the problem. Everybody knows it's bad, but what do you do about it? One of the ways you go about trying to solve a problem is to study what we think is really the case versus what is really the case. And, and let's take a look at some of the half myths about smoking. Number one, tobacco use is declining. It's not. Teenage smoking is on the rise. And our government claims it's doing all it can. I don't think so. And instead of being accountable for it, all it asks for is more money. I'm not certain government knows what to do about smoking. I certainly don't trust the government to do a whole lot in my life, and therefore I'm not so certain I would trust everything that we hear about public service ads at three in the morning and, and uh, having um, you know, all sorts of pictures up on television and so forth. It's not as simple as that. You've got to really get under people's skin and, and almost look at it from a way that your job depends on it. If your job depended on there being a reduction in the morbidity and mortality from smoking, the death and disease from smoking, I can guarantee you that you would do more. All of us would be doing more. But in fact, the surgeon gets paid to take out the lungs. The radiologist gets paid to uh, do the x-rays and, and give the radiotherapy. And the oncologist gets paid to treat with the chemicals and so forth. There's really no incentive to reduce the death and disease from smoking to begin with. Tobacco companies are diversifying. Well, that's true, 
because they're making so much money that they've been able to buy food companies so that Philip Morris owns General Foods, for instance. Over 3,000 food products in your house are owned by a tobacco company. But all of the profit, virtually all, comes from the tobacco part of it. The profit from Marlboro is more than all of the 3,000 Kraft General Foods products combined. North Carolina is not our top tobacco state. That could just as well be New York because that's where most of the tobacco companies are headquartered. That's where they have their advertising agencies and their access to the mass media. Cigarette ads are off television. Well, I tape 8 to 12 hours of tobacco-sponsored sporting events every single weekend, largely on auto racing and other motorsports. But they sponsor things like the Virginia Slims Women's Pole or the Virginia Slims Legends Tennis Tournament. And still in 1977, uh, from 1977 to 1997, the Virginia Slims people have not gone away. They now go to selected areas and they have tennis events for AIDS research. They actually have uh, Virginia Slims sponsoring uh, tennis matches, exhibition tennis matches to benefit AIDS research. Everything causes cancer. That's what pe people say to me, but doc, everything causes cancer. And that's the tragedy. If we were to get just that relative risk out of people thinking, oh, but doc, I, I, I think I should, I should uh, get out of that school because it's got asbestos. You know, that's terrible. And, and I, I say, but Helen, it's not the asbestos as much as it is your smoking. And people don't make that connection. They really don't make the connection between cigarette smoking and all of the death and disease. Because it's so simple. One cigarette's not going to kill you, except if you drop it and it catches you on fire. So people aren't going to really look at it and take it that seriously. Oh, and they've got a filter on it, because the filter makes it safe, or low tar makes it safe. But that will be safe for a discussion of smoking cessation, so that you can tell all your patients that a filter is a fraud, that low tar just means low poison. That doesn't make it safer at all. It's just a way to sell more cigarettes. Oh, and everybody's heard the warnings. I had a, a patient that told me she'd never buy the brands that had the warning that said it could hurt the baby. She only bought the brands that said contain carbon monoxide. She believed everything the warning said and only those brands that had that warning. She didn't understand what it was all about. So I felt it's important to study the tobacco industry like a parasitic disease. And in effect, that's what I've been doing for about the last 25 years. And I've often gone to their meetings, such as at the Raleigh Civic and Convention Center for the Tobacco International Exhibition. And I don't always go under my own name, but sometimes I do. And for instance, this time I went with a little bit of a company name that I have called Phil Tui and Son, better known as P. Tui. Now I'm at this meeting and I'm wearing my uh, exhibit uh, ad admission tag and, and all these tobacco people are saying to me, who is P. Tui? And I'm trying hard not to laugh because if you know what P. Tui is, that's what the cartoon characters do when they, they spit P. Tui. And so, I think it's always fun to have a little bit of sense of humor about this, but as soon as I explain, oh, I'm an analyst just here sent by my company to analyze the industry, they say, oh, well, let's show you what a very good prospect we are. And they show me their economic reports and their own projections by the year 2000 is to see a dramatic rise in tobacco production and use worldwide. So that, in fact, demand can, cannot even, uh, can, can it actually exceeds production. So if you go down to the United States and see that our demand is slightly declining, our production now exceeds far our demand. And we're exporting to Asia and Africa and Central America. And we are now really the ugly Americans sending these products all over the world to help balance our trade deficit. Meanwhile, lung cancer has surpassed breast cancer among women. We're not reading about that in the women's magazines because that would be bad news for the cigarette advertisers. And we don't see pictures of lung cancer in the women's magazines because that would bring it home, that this is no joke. It's not just some little Virginia Slims or Eve or Misty. It's something very, very serious. The mist maybe in the, the, the oxygen tent that, that will happen when you have to be in the hospital getting treated for what is a devastating, devastating disease. So I think it's important that we shift our focus away from nicotine. I've never heard anyone go into a store and ask for a pack of nicotine. And away from the whole generic way we talk about tobacco and nicotine. And instead talk about the real issues that people have on their mind. Marlboro, Virginia Slims, Camel, 
Coors, Budweiser, Miller, those are the things that people buy. Oh, give me a six pack of alcohol? Well, that would be silly. No one would ever know what you're talking about. You have to know the brand, and that's very crucial. That's what we should be talking about with our patients. Instead of just talking about lung cancer and heart disease and emphysema, we should be understanding what their promotions are for all of these brands, where they are. If you go in Houston, Texas on Richmond Avenue, almost every nightclub has a promotion every night for Marlboro or Virginia Slims or Camel or Cool or Benson and Hedges. One of those brands will usually be sponsoring one of those nightclubs. We need to stay in touch with that, understand how auto racing and, and cigarette smoking have been blended together. And instead of just focusing on smokers, the users, we really need to start looking at the pushers. And who are they? Well, they're the American tobacco companies, the, the ones that we've been reading about. The, well, actually, I call them cancer's seven warning signs. Number one is Philip Morris, makers of Marlboro, Virginia Slims, and Merit. They also own Kraft General Foods. And then there's RJR Nabisco, makers of Camel and Winston and Oreo Cookies and Fig Newtons and Lowe's and Lorillard, which is Newports, or Brown and Williamson, which is cool. American Brands was absorbed by Brown and Williamson, and they make Lucky Strike, and Liggett and Myers there, they make the cheap generic brands, so you get your lung cancer for about half the price. And then U.S. Tobacco Company, the makers of Skoll or Copenhagen. So I started DOC in 1977, a group of physicians who would go into the schools, go around the community, would work in their clinics, to counteract the promotion of unhealthy products. We wanted to tap the highest level of commitment of every health professional and also tap the highest level of creativity of every teenager to use brand name ridicule to purchase counter advertising space in the mass media. And no other organization anywhere has, con has continued to do that as we have. So you might start by looking at Mad Magazine. That's my leading medical journal. You know, let's see if we could gross people out to call to their attention of what this is doing. Let's get the kids grossed out. What do you say to a kid that smokes? Let me get this straight. Now, you're 15, you're in ninth grade, and you still smoke? Come on, you're too old to smoke. That's for little kids. Or, what is that smell? Oh, oh I'm so sorry. What is that, Virginia Slims? I can't, ugh, yeah. Or, or how about, are, are your teeth that yellow? Or is that, or I couldn't believe, it. is that Marlboro's or what? So the whole point is, you got to laugh. You got to get the kids looking at it from a, the standpoint, this is not an adult custom. It's just as stupid if an adult is doing it. And gross them out. We give little prescriptions in the office to give to the parents, to give to the kids, or vice versa. One of the best lines I've ever heard was the 11-year-old boy that said to his mother every time his father lit up, say, Mom, are you going to get married again after Daddy dies? Now, you know, a lot of times people don't realize how, how educational children can be in, in, a, in, a, in a very subversive way. And he stopped. He, he was a dentist. He never smoked again after hearing that line a few times. And what happens when you go out to the, the pharmacies? Oh, there they are for the handicapped parking under the Winston sign in pharmacies. I mean, it's amazing to think that pharmacies that we trust are still selling cigarettes. I urge people not to get their prescriptions filled at the major pharmacy chains. Walgreens and Eckert's. Instead, go to those local apothecaries that don't want to sell cigarettes and, and, and write to the managed care plans and say, stop giving those big discounts to the big pharmacies. Go for the small apothecary that really cares about people. And what about billboards? Well, you can work on zoning. Here is one for Kent Golden Lights. And you look at that often enough and you get sick of that as this guy at this Howard Johnson's plant did and he called him up and he said, get rid of that sign, I don't want it there anymore. And they said, no, that's our legal sign. He said, okay, I'll tear it down. And then they quietly took it away. You can work on zoning. Now you see it, now you don't. You can actually get rid of billboards in your community. There are five times as many billboards in African American areas as there are in non-African American areas. Amazing how they can go after people like that. Oh, we're fighting for your life. This is what the Heart Association says. Oh, but that's just a public service ad, like the ones that say, learn to read, fight illiteracy, call this number. I mean, it, it's crazy. So we're fighting for your life. And the tobacco companies simply come along and say, we offer you more because they know how to buy their space. That one on the left is a public service ad that didn't cost anything. The one on the right is a real ad that costs good money. And that's what the billboard companies want. And what I think is important is to take out a map to see where teenagers hang out, to take out a calendar to see when they're going to be there, usually nights, weekends, and holidays, and above all, take out your camera. 
Send some pictures to Doc, and we'll put them in our slideshows, which we do all over the world, and we'll make you a member of our team. We call it the Fast Action Response Team. And what we try to do is to tap into the community, monitor where they are and when they are, and we'll know actually how to get ahead of the game. But then we see even looming over schoolyards. Here is a picture that was sent to me by someone in, from Austin, Texas. Looming right over that schoolyard is another billboard. But it doesn't matter if it's 1,000 feet away or 1,001 feet away. And now the billboards don't even say any words. They're just a casual image. And maybe it's just supposed to blend right into that landscape. Just here's a cowboy in Texas. And how about the other kinds of images? Oh, taste country fresh Salem. Well, the billboard companies wouldn't let us up there. So Doc began to buy bus bench spaces. So we, we decided to welcome people to the taste of country fresh arsenic. And you can imagine the first few times people were driving by, what's that new brand? You know, I've never seen that brand before. Hey, you didn't put the warning label on. And they were, we didn't do a, a double blind controlled study, but there were more skid marks after our bus benches than any other bus benches in town. And then during Black History Month, save $1.50 on sale. And that's crazy. You don't save $1.50 on that stuff. That's ridiculous. We simply said 10 years supply, only 7,000 bucks. Just another way to talk about how much money. It cost only about 15 cents to make a pack of cigarettes. They sell it for two bucks. And Arctic Lights, this was an old brand they don't make anymore. So we decided to say, hey, how about Arctic Lungs? Guaranteed to make you cool as a corpse. And this is the kind of imagery that we need to be doing. We've made commercials for radio and television this way, laughing at the pushers. Or how about that ship, Cuddy Sark, around Christmas time that they advertise for all the Christmas gifts? We said, hey, that's crazy. You don't want to give a bottle of booze. How about the ship going down saying, Cuddy sank? People like ships sail better when they're not loaded. That's the way we really need to be, laughing these pushers out of town. Or how about the Miller Lite beer party that they had at the Houston Astrodome a few years ago? We're having a party with the WHO to benefit the Special Olympics. Those kids, some of them have fetal alcohol syndrome. So we created a t-shirt that said, killer light beer, we're having a party. We're, having, we're pushing a drug. And uh, what we had instead of Miller Light beer, we're having a party, we had killer light beer, we're pushing a drug. And we had all the different diseases, cirrhosis, alcoholic hepatitis, fetal alcohol syndrome, pancreatitis, impotence. And uh, on the back of it, we had a guy doing what you do when you drink in Miller beer is you throw up. They're pushing a drug, we said, but we're grabbing a potty. Now, the, the, they, they sued me in court. They said, oh, you can't laugh at a beer company. Oh, yes, yes, you can. And the American Civil Liberties Union defended us, and we showed you can laugh at the beer and cigarette companies. And we won that case. Oh, but then you had this macho dope with a cigarette saying, hanging out of his jeans saying, hey, I smoke for taste. So we said, hey, how about a much more macho guy saying, hey, I smoke for smell. And that's the kind of image we needed to be doing all these years laughing and laughing and laughing at them. You could see this expanding. You go to a party, hey, do you got a light? Or how about the couple of the 1990s? They smoke for smell. And I think that this is really where we should have been all along, fighting with humor, not with moral outrage. And when Virginia Slims comes to Houston to benefit AIDS research, we have our own tournament, which we call naturally the emphysema slims you've coughed up long enough baby and we have martina no smoke nova and billy jean butthead and monica sellout and emphysema garris and we have the whole crew of big brawny football players we dress them up in tutus and, and they play a mock game of tennis but the high school students really get a charge out of this and how about the newport boomerang now newport has that as its symbol but the boomerang is something that can come back to haunt you and a few years ago, I heard that we had the U.S. Boomerang team as an American team. I didn't know anything about this. And they were going to go to Australia, sponsored by a tobacco company. I contacted them, and I said, hey, you don't want to do that. How about taking our money instead? And so they uh, went with a no-smoking logo, and we won the World Boomerang Championship. So I'm like the Don King of Boomerang. And... Um, what about the, when Houston was subjected to this brand called Dakota? This was test market in Houston. Houston is famous for big deals, big domes, and individuals who make up their own minds. You decide, Dakota or Marlboro. We said, oh, no, that's crazy. How about Dakota, Dakoff, De Cancer, or Dakoff? Well, the Houston Chronicle would not take this ad. They said, oh, no, no, that would offend people. You know who they were talking about. They're cigarette advertisers because the mass media are just as guilty of promoting this as the tobacco companies themselves. 
And lately, we see this at all the nightclubs and all around the country, the Marlboro gear. Get them while they're young. The Marlboro Adventure gear and the Marlboro Adventure team. So we have created, in response to this, the Barfboro Barfing Team. And we have the Barfmobile, and we're taking it all over the United States. It's been in about 35 states already. We hope that we can take this all over the United States and barf on Marlboro. And I've, I've brought for my audiences, wherever we go, we have the barf on Marlboro, barf, official Barfboro barf bag. And we have a whole host of, of other um, uh, barfing uh, humor that we, we, we hope will begin to laugh the pushers out of town. And this last slide really says it all. This is a guy named Dave Gerlitz. He's the, the bright one lighting up under the fuel tank there in that ad. And uh, he once worked for Winston Cigarettes for, for many years. And, and, and he told me that one time he asked the people at Winston, how come none of you guys smoke? And they laughed in his face. They said, are you kidding? We wouldn't smoke that stuff. We regard that, f we, 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 we reserve that right for the young, the poor, and the stupid. Well, I should have warned you that this talk was going to be a bit hazardous to people's preconceptions about how we should be going after the tobacco and alcohol pushers. And I think I've offered a, a way to do that through humor. And joining Doc or Doctors Order Care might just be the way to do that. We um, hope that you'll be able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. The buildings that uh, are on Madison Avenue the buildings that rip people off, the, the buildings that create these advertising slogans. We hope that you'll be able to be faster than a speeding bullet and more powerful than a locomotive in setting what we call a Super Health 2000 example for your community. So with that, I'd like to thank you and look forward to laughing these pushers out of town. In the American play, Mornings at Seven, a fella has just come home from visiting his doctor, and he's talking to his wife on the front porch of their house, and he's very, very upset. And this, this is what he says. Then he listened to my heart with one of those ear things. Listened quite a while, didn't say a word. Scared me to death. Then he began to thump me. Chest, sides, back, all over. Still didn't say a word. Took my blood pressure, wound a little sack around my arm, uh, watched a needle, uh, pumped a little machine. He, he did everything you could think of. Examination lasted over an hour. Then you know what he said? His wife says, what? He says, Mr. Swanson, there's not a thing in the world the matter with you. You've got a good heart, sound lungs, fine stomach. I don't know when I've seen a man of your age as well off as you are. Now, what do you know about that? He's just a lousy doctor, that's all. She says, did you tell him about your neck? He says, of course I did. Said it wasn't anything to worry about. By God, I don't know how a doctor like that gets the reputation he has. Didn't even say I had to give up smoking. She said, well, that's silly. Everybody knows you ought to give up smoking. He says, sure they do. I smoke too much. Look at that. Stands to reason when a man gets along in years, he's got to cut down on things like that. Well, <laughs> I'll see old Doc Brooks tomorrow. He may be old, but I bet he knows enough to tell me to quit smoking. You know, and, and there it is. Quit smoking. That's about all we have in medicine to talk to people about. It's like eat your spinach when you're young or clean your plate or clean your room. And you know, as soon as your mom told you to do that, you do the opposite. So what we do in medicine is set ourselves up as a kind of a foil, almost going through this ritual of doing this and that and so forth. And you know, that's our job description. But I think that what we really need to do is to think beyond the finger wag. I used to have a forehand finger wag and a, a backhand. I could. I could alienate any patient I wanted to just by doing this. But the thing is, I began to listen, began to hear that, in fact, when it comes to smoking, the patients could be said to know even more than we do. There isn't anyone over the age of two that hasn't heard that smoking is dangerous to your health. Everybody knows that. And what I think it is our challenge is to go beyond the formula, go beyond the recipe. Now, I mean, I realize that there are all these products being advertised. Uh, Nicorette and Nicoderm, and perhaps you haven't heard about my product, Nicopositories. Uh, we're going to test it out on all the pharmaceutical people that come into the offices and get us to try all these things. But what we, what we want to do is to move beyond just a straightforward pharmacologic approach. And I realize that there are all these clinical guidelines out there that 
uh, talk to you about what you're supposed to do with every patient and offer them nicotine replacement therapy. And I begin to wonder, is everything got to be in a recipe? Is everything got to be dictated to by some government agency? I don't think so. And I hope you won't get into that with smoking. I don't think it's something that's so simply formulaic that you can do all these things just like the cookbook says. I'm not opposed to all these drugs. I'm just saying I think that they're a last resort and not a first resort. I think there's so much we could be doing with patients that we're not doing. So much to appeal to them as consumers and not just as victims of uh, nicotine addiction. And I'd hope that you won't always just say, oh, you're addicted. Oh, that's the most potent addiction since heroin, because it's almost like saying, oh, you'll never be a physician. You'll never be a doctor. No way. No. And if you beat somebody down like that every day, and you convince them that it's actually harder than it really is, then you're going to make it harder. There are certain words that I never use. I never talk about quit. I want you to set a quit date or be a quitter. Because, I mean, who, who's, a, who's a quitter? I mean, some of my construction worker colleagues are more courageous than I. They don't want to be quitters. So I think that the word is very negative. And I think that, too, if you set a quit date, half the people pick January 1st, New Year's Eve anyway, and they, they quickly get rid of that resolution. So I think what we have to do is to be a little bit more creative. And we need to work in our clinics, of course, but we need to see what's going on out in the schools, in the classrooms, and above all, in the community. What I think we really first need to do is to steep ourselves in an understanding of what is this issue all about? Where did the smoking pandemic begin? And then, and only then, once, once we understand how many times we've gone through this fanaticism aimed at tobacco use, only then can we know maybe we could do it differently. Maybe there is a way that we could approach it. And so I'd like to then conclude with a way that I think one-on-one -on -one with your patient, you might be able to have some better success. If you simply try, that's better than nothing. And I think that's the, the hope that I can offer, that the time and the caring that you show patients and the commitment that you give them matters more than all of the drugs and all of the other therapies that have been created to fight smoking since time immemorial. So where did it all begin? How old is smoking and, and, and why are we faced with half a million deaths a year from lung cancer and emphysema and heart disease? I think that the earliest images I've been able to find about cigarette smoking illustrate this quite well. They appeared on tobacco trading cards. So let's go back about 120 years and take a look at a typical tobacco trading card with Miss Sissy Imray. And here she is, rather risque woman. Imagine what this was like in, in, in the, the late 1800s. This is very, very uh, pornographic even. But this was a way that the tobacco companies caught on by putting a card in their cigarette packs they were able to get people to have brand loyalty and to try to collect all of the different young ladies that were illustrated with a little bit of ankle showing in their cigarette packs. And, and then we had the, the slightly more buttoned down version, the domesticated woman, mild and sweet welcome cigarettes she promoted. And on the back of the card, it said, welcome cigarettes were a light and delicate smoke that you could indulging continuously without any possible injurious effects. And how were they chosen? Especially on account of the small percentage of nicotine. Now you say, wait a minute, this is over 120 years ago. They're talking about injurious effects, so did they know? The earliest reference I've been able to find to lung cancer and smoking comes from the Lancet around 1858. Already there are commentaries on the devastating toll taken by tobacco. But the cigarette had not really caught on very well at that point. The predominant form of tobacco was cigars and spitting tobacco and pipes. Those had been used for 300 years ever since Sir Walter Raleigh and others and Jean Nicot brought back Indian tobacco from the New World to uh, the continent. And what we're looking at now in talking about injurious effects in a cigarette ad is very curious because it even says especially chosen on account of the small percentage of nicotine. So could it be? Were they worried about nicotine even then? It seems so. And they were a light smoke. Isn't that funny? We talk about light cigarettes today, almost the same thing. So already we have a pattern that smoking was good for your health. Why would that be advertised? 
because how was the predominant use of tobacco 120 years ago? It was used spitting tobacco, plug tobacco, or cigars, and that you had to spit into those beautiful cuspidors, those brass spittoons, which you seldom see except in the legislatures that pass all the legislation. And what I think that what we realized is that why did that change? Why did it suddenly become cigarette smoking that was promoted? It wasn't sudden, but over time until the mass cigarette making machine was invented, people were discovering that spitting tobacco spread disease. And a number of legislatures and parliaments around the world passed anti-spitting ordinances, laws to prevent you from spitting everywhere you could. So the spitting tobacco sales went down, and they had to teach people how to inhale, and so the cigarette sales went up. And how were the diseases, which ones were they? Tuberculosis. Spreading disease caused, spreading through spitting tobacco caused tuberculosis. So Cox postulates, which found that, uh, that this was the case, led to legislation and the tobacco companies, in the interest of public health, really pushed the cigarette that they had to teach people how to inhale. But it wasn't until the 19-teens that even men began smoking very heavily. How was that? They did so because of, of efforts by medical societies and medical auxiliaries to raise money to send cigarettes to the boys in the trenches in World War I. Even then, Cigarettes were promoted as having a certain kind of a, a health value. Here was another trading card. The trading cards went on right through the 1950s. And here was Will cigarettes in the 1920s and 30s actually having a home exercises. Looks like he's got a little barrel chest, but the kids would collect all of these trading cards. And this was 10 times as popular as any baseball card ever has been. Everyone collected tobacco trading cards, and the kids would sit outside the tobacco shops and, and say, Mr., do you have any cigarette cards? And I've collected some of these, and here is the Lambert and Butler cigarettes showing further exercise training that you could do. On the back was a little advertisement for Lambert and Butler cigarettes. And then the most famous tr trading card of all time was that of Hannes Wagner, the baseball star. Why was it famous? Because he once he heard that he was depicted on a tobacco trading card, he sued the company and said, that's, that's terrible, I do not use tobacco, and this is a sacrilege to do this. And they supposedly yanked all of his trading cards, but about a dozen got out, and those now are worth in excess of a half a million dollars apiece. And so Hannes Wagner, along with hundreds of other baseball players, was, was depicted uh, in tobacco trading cards that kids collected. Then the 19... The 20s, when health claims were continuing to be made. Head stuffed up, smoke a Listerine cigarette and feel relief. Always that health claim. They even had asthma cigarettes, deliciously creamy um, cigarettes for asthma and even cholera. That's right, the inhalation of tobacco smoke was said to be good for health. This comes from the turn of the century, of course, but the health claims went on until even the present time. It wasn't until the 1920s that women got their equal smoking rights to keep a slender figure, no one could deny, reach for a lucky instead of a sweet. I always wondered if you could see a, an ad for Tootsie Roll saying, no throat irritation, no cough, whether people would believe that. But that's how cigarettes were promoted. They were promoted for good health reasons. And a number of women switched from candy to cigarettes, thus causing outrage in the confectionery industry. And then, do you inhale? Everybody's doing it. Seven out of ten smokers inhale knowingly. The other three inhale unknowingly because this was an industry that even said the person who smoked didn't even know whether he was inhaling. And now they go to every state and, and federal legislature and say if you pass anti-smoker bills, is what they call the clean indoor air legislation, you're going to bring back racial segregation. Advertising can be very powerful and it can move people to do things they might otherwise have done or believed. How about athletes who could say they don't get your wind? They've got those extras that win ball games, said Joe DiMaggio and Lou Gehrig and Stan Musial and other baseball players throughout the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. And my father and I would watch the Dodger game sponsored by uh, Lucky Strike, and uh, he was very upset in the 1950s that this could happen. And so he told me, please, whatever you do, tape record these commercials, because in just a few years, no one would ever believe that they could have promoted sports and tobacco together. Well, there's more tobacco-sponsored sporting events today than ever before in the form of motor racing and tennis and skiing all around the world 
and it's truly gone beyond anything we'd ever thought because with satellite and cable television now, an audience of Formula One uh, racing, which is sponsored almost exclusively by the tobacco companies, will reach 41 billion viewers in a single year. So little did he know the situation would get a lot worse than it ever has been. And then in the 1930s, we actually had women getting the Marlboro brand because at that time Marlboro was a woman's cigarette. Gee, Mama, you sure enjoy your Marlboros. Marlboros was a, a very dainty cigarette with red tips to match your pretty lips. And it wasn't until the 1950s when the boys came back from, World War, from uh, the Korean War, unlike after World War II, when they had been greeted as heroes, now they were sort of a, a tie, you know, the, the tie is not like, it's like Vince Lombardi said, like kissing your sister. So they weren't greeted as heroes, and the very clever ad agency from Marlboro decided to make them heroes by taking war vets and putting tattoos on the back of their hand and creating the macho Marlboro brand debuted in Dallas, Texas with a cowboy and with a sailor, and um, that was an instant overnight success. But really, it was the health claims. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And little Johnny could call for Philip Morris, and nobody ever stopped to wonder what stunted his growth. But that's what we saw was health claims rapidly evolving in the 1930s and 40s. That's for you, said Johnny, the cigarette recognized by doctors as proved less irritating to the nose and throat. And the commercials on radio and television, night in and night out. But believe it or not, doctors were actually in the ads saying, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. They talked about the T-zone, T for throat and T for taste, and we say T for tracheostomy today. And they, they, they said eight out of 10 doctors preferred camels, and the joke was the other two preferred women. But the fact of the matter is, this was the way in which cigarettes were promoted. Why? Why the health claims? Why did the health claims extend even to the American Medical Association? This was a typical ad in the Journal of the American Medical Association and the state journals, the New York State Journal of Medicine, which I used to edit, advertising camel cigarettes at the AMA convention, the camel scientific exhibit, where they could show you how all the smoke uh, was variously uh, uh, removed at various levels of your, of your throat through science, less irritating. But think about that. How did we get into that position? How did we endorse cigarettes? Did the physicians not know? Of course we knew, but the money for the advertising was still too great. Until what year could you go to medical society meetings and still come home with a carton of cigarettes? Believe it or not, the early 1980s. I spoke at the Kentucky Medical Association, and a woman came up to me afterwards and was crying, and, and, and she said, what a wonderful presentation to talk about this devastating problem. I said, yes, but you're crying. She says, yes, my sister, I learned yesterday, has lung cancer. I said, oh, that's terrible. That's, that's, she said, you don't know the half of it. I gave her her lung cancer. I said, no, how could you do that? You work for the medical society. She said, before I worked for the medical society, I used to work for R.J. Reynolds, and I had the biggest booth at these meetings. All the doctors would line up for their cartons of, of camels, and I gave the excess to my sister. Well, that was through the early 1980s. And, and then even in the Journal of the American Medical Association, right through 1954, you could open up every single week and see ads, if pleasure's your aim, not medical claims, light an old goal. How can we really say that we were duped by this? We were duped by the money. The money that poured into the AMA from the tobacco companies so that the AMA saw no evil, heard no evil, and said no evil for so many years until really it was too late. Here's an ad from another medical journal talking about the real importance of less nicotine in cigarette smoke. When I showed this to a group of uh, plaintiff's attorneys, the ones who were suing the tobacco companies, and you know, I love lawyers, you know, it's, it's uh, suppose you should take one to lunch, you know, or something like that to let, get to know them better. And, and I saw this bumper sticker that said, sick, see a lawyer. I mean, if you look at what they've done to the tobacco issue, they have created this wonderful fantasy that only the tobacco companies knew that smoking was bad for our health, and nobody else knew. And in fact, the tobacco companies, unbeknownst to any of us, actually put nicotine in cigarettes. Oh my God. And this is the kind of nonsense that we're letting ourselves believe that the evil tobacco companies conspired to keep everyone addicted with nicotine because we didn't know anything about this. This is sheer, unadulterated nonsense. And it takes real courage, I think, to stop and realize, are we revising history? 
are we forgetting about our own collaboration as a medical profession for so many years with this industry? The real importance of less nicotine in cigarette smoke, an ad appearing in a medical journal talking about the pharmacologic and physiologic aspects of nicotine and how your patients should get less of it. And they talked about reducing nicotine intake. Please advise your patients to this effect. And trying to get patients, almost all of whom smoke, doctors smoke, 70% uh, of doctors smoked in the 1940s and 50s. But then that was the real problem. Hill and Dahl and Winder and Graham and Everts and DeBakey and Oxner came out with reports showing the devastating impact of cigarette smoking on the medical population. So in the early 50s, the doctors stopped smoking en masse. They went down from two-thirds to, to uh, much, much less, less than half in the 1950s. And now it's less than 10% of physicians smoke. But I think the key thing is to understand what do the tobacco companies do at, to respond to all of these health reports. And that's the crux of knowing how to deal with this issue today. How do we approach patients today based on something that we've known for 50 years that we haven't applied? Thinking about what made the cigarettes from 1950 on different from the cigarettes before 1950, and that is the filter. The filter is the crux of this issue because the early cigarette filters were put on there as a response to all of the health reports that were coming out in the various medical journals about the dangers of smoking. And the word was beginning to leak out to our patients. So the tobacco companies, my theory is, they, they didn't know what to do and they were all scared. They had all these reports coming out. And one guy very quietly calmed people down, probably noticed a little bit of oil stain on his finger and said, hey, I've got an idea. Let's put a filter on it, in with the good air, out with the bad air. And what were the early cigarette filters made out of? Asbestos. Asbestos. So safe, so pure, it's used to filter the air in many hospitals. But this is how we began to see the cigarette evolving. Let's take a look at a very early tobacco ad on television, and then let's see how it evolved once the filter was placed on cigarette smoking. How about an ad for Philip Morris? When you change to Philip Morris, you'll feel better. Did you say I'll feel better smoking Philip Morris? Yes, you'll feel better. And here are the reasons why. In case after case, coughs due to smoking disappear. Parched throat clears up. That stale, smoked out feeling vanishes. That is wonderful. When you change to Philip Morris, you really taste your cigarette once again. The clear, clean taste of fine, mellow tobacco. And your food will taste better, too. But why do these wonderful things happen when I change to Philip Morris? Because you'll be smoking the one cigarette with a difference in manufacture. An important difference that avoids a common cause of cigarette irritation. Day after day, you'll be smoking the cigarette recommended by eminent nose and throat specialists to patients who smoke. The one cigarette proved definitely milder than any other leading brand. Well, that's what we saw when um, the tobacco companies were advertising when television came into vogue in the very late 1940s, with Philip Morris being less irritating. But then the filter came into being. And the typical filter cigarette ad was this one for uh, just what the doctor ordered. L&M. And, and, and the, the whole notion of believing that something could be made safer by simply putting some little wad at the end of it. And what were the early cigarette filters made out of? Asbestos. That's right, the whole notion of thinking that you could put an asbestos filter on a cigarette and make it safer. And let's take a quick look and, and see how these ads evolved. No, we're trying this to take a look house, at the slides Billy. now, and I will say that the clips He's pretty come handy to the clips, because this clip comes a little Steve, bit later. home from college. Is, is what it, dear? I'm sorry, I don't understand. Slide you'd like to continue with? That's not a slide on there. I don't see any slides. These are, that's the film clip. There it is. No, it's, it's the one before it. Okay. 
Frederick March, the actor, looking like a doctor, talking about L&M filters, just what the doctor ordered, the whole notion of the filter and the filter wars that occurred, television demonstrations, uh, advertising Kent, the one cigarette that can show you proof of greater health protection by blowing through a napkin. They showed this was yellow and this one wasn't as yellow. And just this went on night in and night out, showing the health claims made by cigarette smoking. Viceroy gave you double-barreled health protection and notice where they advertised on the medicine pages of Time magazine. And then the verdict was announced. The Surgeon General's report of 1964, the devastating impact that that made on the whole way in which cigarettes were thought about and were promoted. The whole question was answered at that time, and the Royal College of Physicians had answered that question two years earlier, but the American Medical Association didn't listen. They said, oh, we need more research. And so for the next 15 years, they spent studying the issue, getting $10 million initially and another $8 million from the tobacco industry, basically to keep their mouth shut. And what they did was confirm by 1978 all of the findings that we already knew 20 years earlier. They, in effect, exchanged opposition to Medicare for the, the uh, op opposing view that we didn't really know whether cigarette smoking was really that bad. And yet, in its own statement to the Federal Trade Commission in 1964, right after the Surgeon General's report came out, the AMA opposed warning labels claiming that for the, for the last 10 years, the public has already known about the well-known dangers of smoking. And then what happened to cigarette advertising during that time? Here was a typical Marlboro ad, night in and night out, night in and night out. But something happened to change that, thanks to one lawyer who attacked these ads and said, we need to apply the fairness doctrine to get equal time. And this is the kind of advertisement that you began to see. And let me show you this old commercial that ran around 1967 that had William Talman from Perry Mason trying to combat the menace that would do him in himself. Billy, he's pretty handy to have around. Steve, home from college. Barbie, looking after her brother Timmy. Debbie, who will soon graduate from high school. Susan, our youngest, and my wife, Peggy, who looks after all of us. And that's me, Bill Tolman, with a friend of mine you might recognize. You know, I didn't really mind losing those courtroom battles, but I'm in a battle right now I don't want to lose at all. Because if I lose it, it means losing my wife and those kids you just met. I've got lung cancer. So take some advice about smoking and losing from someone who's been doing both for years. If you don't smoke, don't start. If you do smoke, quit. Don't be a loser. Well, there he was, Bill Talman. And then that ad was so effective, along with others that, that uh, were shown, that the tobacco companies themselves moved to get off television because they couldn't take the competition of the counter ads. And so after 67, you began to uh, see different kinds of ads on television. And let's bring it up to date to see where in the late 70s the doctor was portrayed in this issue. Oh, there he is again, driving up the cost of medical care. It's always about money, said Time Magazine, and those evil doctors with their masks uh, as dollar bills were, were defeating what we were trying to do in, in, in getting lowered medical cost. Of course, Time Magazine didn't want you to know that on the back cover they were promoting high health costs themselves with the cigarette advertisements that talked about the solution for 100 smokers, whatever they are. And Time Magazine didn't tell you how avidly they advertised in tobacco industry trade publications to say where there's smoke, there's a hot market for cigarette advertisers in Time Magazine. Time Magazine comes into our very own waiting rooms and schools with, rife with cigarette ads and then blames doctors for the cost of medical care. Newsweek could also say this, and uh, Time Magazine and Newsweek alike could talk about pretending that this is a war between smokers and anti-smokers. This is a war between all of us and the tobacco promoters. And here is how Newsweek portrayed what causes cancer in the late 1970s. Well, uh, again, on the back cover, they helped promote uh, cancer, but they didn't really want you to make that connection. 
But in the actual article itself, this is how the cancer causes were listed. Cancer and the environment, the 10 top suspects, arsenic, asbestos, benzene, benzene. Look at where it is, number nine out of 10, tobacco smoke, listed in alphabetical order. I know, I've never seen the winners of a marathon listed in alphabetical order. Always this deception carried on by our mass media, even better than the tobacco companies could do. Always acting in the interest of their advertisers. And then low tar. Tar was the real issue here. First, the filter, which allayed people's anxieties. And secondly, tar. But Doc, I smoke low tar. It's very, I, I would never smoke high tar because that would be very bad. And I'd say, that's, that's terrific, Helen. But the problem is, you're not getting the whole point. Tar just means a composite of over 4,000 solid chemical poisons, including over 40 known chemical cancer causers. The, the scientific definition of tar is crap. I mean, you wouldn't go into a store and buy a loaf of Wonder Bread that was advertised as having only two ounces of crap in every loaf, or a can of soup that was advertised as two ounces of arsenic in every can, and yet that's how cigarettes are promoted, always having low tar. And that's how the tobacco companies have been able to survive, by adapting to what the medical community says should be done. Or they, the community said, put a filter on it. Oh, and take out the bad stuff. And the tobacco companies went right along with the game. Even until the mid-1980s, an ad could appear in a medical journal talking about the importance of switching to low-tar cigarettes. This is as late as 1983 to see an ad in a cigarette, a cigarette ad in a medical journal. Ah, uh, but here we are, up to 1990, and that's when the headlines began to appear. Physicians join tobacco issue. Where were they? That's the big question. Not what did the tobacco companies know and when did they know it, but when did we know? My grandmother knew about the dangers of smoking. Should we indict her for, for knowing this and not telling the world? I think every one of us knew, but now we're trying to cover up and pretend that we didn't really know. But what does the doctor say to patients? What do we say to dogs? Okay, Ginger, I've had it. You stay out of the garbage. Understand, Ginger? You stay out of the garbage or else. But what do dogs hear? Blah, 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 Ginger, blah, 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 Ginger, blah, 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 Ginger. I mean, pretty soon dogs only hear what they want to hear. And, and people only hear what they want to hear. Everyone's heard about the dangers of smoking. They need to hear something different. They need to hear something better than just that. The physician needs to decide whether he or she is going to be in just patient education issues, which is great enough, but that's just getting someone back from a minus to zero, from smoking to not smoking. And I think that's a great objective, but perhaps not sufficient. I think we need to do more than just to make a tobacco-free generation. We ought to really work with kids to have them do well in math and science and athletics and not just have them be free of tobacco smoke or free of drugs. It's a pretty weak objective. And I think the key thing is we need to move beyond into health promotion actively encouraging people to have better health than they've ever had before. And if you'd like, medical activism, where we get out in the streets and in the legislatures and everywhere else, and we back up our words with action. The obstacles to smoking cessation until now have been that it's oh, uh, not part of the reimbursement system. And, and we do procedures. We don't do that. We're not trained in that. And, and physicians really were quite cynical about this for so long. And patients would, would be offended, we would claim, oh, if we brought up cigarette smoking. None of these is true. I think that smoking cessation ought to be part and parcel of everyone's practice, including the, the finest sub-sub-specialist, because the, the patient will be so impressed that the physician has taken an extra 30 seconds to two minutes to talk to the patients about that. That's the key of all the variables, is your time and your caring and your commitment much more so than all of the drugs put together. But instead of just talking about the dangers of smoking, you need to move to attitudes. No behavior can change without changing attitudes. And where are attitudes changed? In our society, largely through the mass media. The workplace has a role. That's why the clean indoor air laws that affect the workplace have been so successful in reducing smoking, because when you can't smoke, you don't smoke. And I think it's very important that we look at that that we don't just preach people from our vantage point because we're at the bottom of the list in terms of really the time that we have with people. They watch more sports, they're shopping, they're dining, they're out in the, in the subways and the buses and on the highways. Families and friends and neighbors have far more influence overall than we do by and large. So what can we do? And I think that that's really the whole issue of what we can do to promote a better way of thinking. 
Unfortunately, we're not helped in this cause by the pharmaceutical companies by and large. Oh, now they're rushing into smoking, but for years they would say things like caraphate for the ulcer-prone smoker. Don't talk to your patient's doctor, just give them a drug. And uh, where there's smoke, there may be bronchitis. Well, that's true, but do you always want to give an antibiotic every time your patient comes in with bronchitis? Do you always want to do that or look at the origin of the bronchitis? Perhaps it is, in many instances, the weakening of the lungs through cigarette smoking. And, and this doctor, he's so concerned about his patient's anxiety, hasn't even noticed her enlarged thyroid, that he's giving her another tranquilizer. I think it's important that we begin to be not just prescribers, but teachers. And that's the thing that patients are looking for. This ad comes from a resident and staff physician. It puts a new high prescriber in the palm of your hand. This was an ad that resident and staff physician placed in a pharmaceutical marketing publication to get you to advertise your drug products to those residents who are going to look at prescribing. And that's all the residents are being regarded as, is just prescribers. I think we need to be doing a lot more. Oh, now they go directly to the consumer. Ask your doctor about Nicorette, because at one time, Nicorette was a prescription drug. And the drug companies assured us that they would never introduce this over the counter, because this could only be successfully used with what they called a comprehensive program of behavior modification. Well, so much for promises, because we're not really taught in behavior modification anyway. We're taught to prescribe. The companies seeing an opening got these drugs over the counter. So what do we do? What can we really do? Oh, uh, some of these are still on prescription. Here is one that is the Habitrol patch. And they're pretending that this has some kind of therapeutic advantage over all the others. I mean, I have my own patch. I call it a placebo patch. It's actually a Band-Aid. We take it out of the Band-Aid drawer. We write on it with a magic marker, don't smoke, dummy. And you have them look at that 20, 30 times a day. I think the whole notion of patches is great, but it's a last resort. It's not something that should be given on the first visit. You can give a trial sample, but I've seen these things used on airplane flights where people can't smoke. I've seen the nicotine replacement therapies used to cover up for the hours that they cannot smoke at work or at, at church and, and not in the proper way. I've seen them cut apart just to be used for a couple of hours so that they can get over that phase. And they're not used always for smoking cessation. We need to understand that at $300 for a 10-week supply of these drugs, it's not always going to be the most economical either. And I know I'm going against the grain, but I'm not going to buy into a pharmacologic method until I've exhausted my own words with patients and got them to understand that I'm on their side. I'm not just going to finger wag to them. It's becoming a business, the stop smoking industry. You could probably get your own franchise by giving people all the, the nicotine replacement therapies or the new uh, antidepressants. I personally choose an antidepressant sooner than I would choose a nicotine replacement drug because the incidence of depression among people who smoke is very high, perhaps 30 or 40 percent. And I think at, at the very least, at least they'll be, feel a little bit better in a few weeks, and I don't think you have a whole lot to lose, although I think it is risky to give a drug on a first or second visit of a patient who smokes. I think we've got to see what their abilities are on their own. So instead of saying, how much do you smoke and how long have you smoked, I, I simply say, well, let's say I have a big truck driver. I say, hey, what brand do you buy? Misty, Virginia Slim, Super Slims, Capri? And, you know, the guy will either slug you or laugh at you. He doesn't know what he's doing. You know, what is he talking about? And, and it calls to mind the notion of branding, women's brands and men's brands. Steve Martin, the comedian, used to say, what is a woman's brand? Do you have a little breast on? I mean, it's so silly, the notion of thinking that there are women's brands and men's brands of cigarettes. So he'll say, no, I buy Marlboro. And then you quickly say, what kind of Marlboro? Marlboro Lights, Marlboro 100s, Marlboro Reds, Marlboro 100 Lights, Marlboro uh, Menthol, Marlboro Menthol Lights, Marlboro Leaded, Marlboro Unleaded. I mean, there are 15 different Marlboros. 1998 has the new Marlboro coming out, the Marlboro Ultralights. And I think that these are things that we need to be attuned to, the vocabulary of how people buy cigarettes. Can I have a package of Benson and Hedges Lights, Crush Fruit Box 100s, Menthol Regulars? Think about that. All those words that they've learned because they think that's their own brand. The filter is a fraud. Why is the filter a fraud? The filter's a fraud because it's got little holes in it that draws in air. You'd say, well, that's good, more air, less bad stuff. But when you put your lips over the holes, you're actually sucking in far more concentrated gases and poisons. It's like sucking through a straw when you have to suck in very hard, and you're accelerating those gases coming, and you're increasing your risk for coronary heart disease and emphysema. 
We don't hear that in all the conventional medical journals or even these clinical guidelines, that filter cigarettes are more harmful than non-filtered cigarettes. The whole game with smoking is to smoke as few as possible. And that's why we say, how much do you buy? Getting the question that, that you're, you're, you're a consumer advocate for them for their buying behavior, and how long have you smoked? Instead of saying, how long have you smoked, say, um, how much do you buy? So what brand do you buy, and how much do you buy? Oh, a pack a day, okay? I said, that's fine, that's just $2 a day, that's just 750 bucks a year. That's a different way to talk about money. That's a way to talk, and not even Ross Perot would pass by a $50 bill in the street. You're talking about a $50 bill every 10 days or so. That's another way to look at how much money people will save. And what about that product? Menthol, what color is menthol? It's not green, it's, it's an anesthetic, it's a colorless anesthetic that deadens the throat and people think it's cooler. A thousand degrees worth of hot teeth yellowers is not gonna be cooler. So menthol deceives the brain and people that you tell that to will be very, uh, uh, um, they'll appreciate that very, very much. The filters are fraud. Low tar just means low crap. And lights, that's just more sugar. Just another way to deceive people into thinking that it's, it's just part of something that might be a little bit safer. It's sort of like jumping from the 26th story of the building instead of the roof of the hospital. This is what I often talk to the patients about. And I think that the, the key thing is to look at how we can individualize our approach. No two people are alike. The 18-year-old girl is far different than the 45-year-old woman. What do we say to the 18-year-old, the 15-year-old? Come on. I mean, you know, it's, it's, you're too old to smoke. This is for the 12-year-olds. Or another way is to just, you know, crinkle your nose and say, I don't know, what is that smell? Oh, oh I'm so sorry, I forget. What are you, Virginia Slims, right? Yeah. Or, you know, are your teeth that yellow? Just another way is to call attention to the cosmetic aspect of smoking. Personalize, you gotta show your care. And demythologize. What are the three biggest myths about smoking? Number one, that it relieves stress. That's called nicotine dependence. That's called not having had nicotine. What we need to do is to get over that notion and you can do that with some simple behavioral methods and some oral substitutes. We need to knock out the notion that smoking keeps your weight down. That's sort of like burning down your house to have roast pig. I mean, that, that's crazy. So you have gotta point out that only a third of people gain weight, a third lose weight, and a third remain the same. If you walk up the stairs after eating when you stop smoking, you won't be gaining weight. You'll be walking around and feeling better and combining the little extra exercise with those little extra calories that you'll be taking in because the food tastes better. And low tar filters are not safer. They're actually far more dangerous. It's the number of cigarettes smoked that counts. What matters most to people, unfortunately or fortunately, is looks, sex, and money. If you can put your analogies into those terms, the facial wrinkling, the fact that, as Alton Oxen used to say, that impotence is far higher and infertility in people who smoke, think about that and, of course, the money. Fear, humor, and anger are always motivators, but I weigh heavily on all three equally. I feel that humor has got to be, get in there somewhere. You can show those lung cancers. It's very, very important to give people a notion of what a lung cancer looks like, but often do it paradoxically. Keep it in your pocket and say, oh, I, I don't want to show you this. Oh, it's terrible. And that's when they'll want to see it and impress upon them what lung cancer really looks like. Or the chest X-ray. That's not a way to really detect lung cancer. By the time you see a lesion, almost any size lesion, you're looking at a death rate that's 19 out of 20 in five years. The five-year survival for non-small cell cancer of the lung is not any better than it was 30 years ago. It's a very poor way to diagnose a, a disease that, that has been laid very early on in life. Or emphysema, that Swiss cheese lung that we need to emphasize, maybe having a picture around the office of, or those premature babies, the million-dollar babies. We need the mothers to make the connection, and we need to figure out better ways to do that out in the community. The myocardial effects of smoking are very, very important. I call it Marlboro's myocardial mayhem. It has a direct uh, uh, increase in the myocardial oxygen demand. The, the heart has to struggle. Exercise performance goes down. The heart attack rate is, is doubled, and of course the angina rate is dramatically increased. There's also a, an atherosclerotic effect. The lipid profile, the, the HDLs go down, the a LDLs go up, the triglycerides go up. There are hematologic factors and, and direct arterial wall effects. It's believed that the very deposition of platelets plays a, 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 is, is, is deposited possibly through carbon monoxide in the smoke on the arterial wall. And blood pressure, while you're smoking, is directly affected. Usually, since you don't take a reading 
as Dr. Norman Kaplan says, while someone is smoking, you don't appreciate the enormous effect that blood pressure uh, is, is having when people smoke. It really wrecks uh, their arterial system sooner or later. And these are the things that we need to be emphasizing. I often talk about the components of cigarette smoke, such as ammonia. That's one of my favorites, because that's the same smell as in urine. And I don't think anyone's going to walk out of your office saying, gee, I, I don't, I, you know, they don't want to smell like urine breath. Uh, and we, I kid sometimes about a brand called Urine Breath 100s that we're going to introduce. But those are the things that often matter just as much to people. And the fertility and fecundability. All of these effects, your very first visit with an infertile couple ought to make sure that no drugs are being used, and especially smoking. It certainly has an effect on sperm and ovulatory cycle and uh, even on embryogenesis and the gonadotropins. The, uh, the way to, I think, begin to approach re planting those seeds is to talk to some people about the money. They're very interested in money. They, a lot of people are buying generic brands. Calculate the pack of day and the cost per pack, the 365. By the time you realize how much money people are spending and then multiply by the number of years, they could have a, a down payment on a house or a car. Uh, I had a patient once that told me he smoked a Porsche. He, he counted up how many years of smoking uh, he'd wasted. And here, notice the real deal. When they talk about raising those taxes, rest assured that the tobacco companies will be introducing generic, cheaper brands to try to appeal to those budget-conscious people who smoke. And the inhalation count. This, I think, is a very sophisticated approach, but it's something that I do. You, every cigarette is 10 inhalations. Multiply that by the number of days they smoke per year and the number of years smoking. You're talking about a million inhalations in a little over a dozen years. It's a frightening thought to think that they're inhaling all that carbon monoxide and cyanide. I often say, why don't you put a grain of, of sand in your gas tank in the morning for every cigarette that you light up? Believe it or not, or even every inhalation that you light up, you're talking about thousands of grains of sand in your gas tank every year or a penny in your backpack for every cigarette you smoke. Come up with those analogies. And above all, the basic behavioral approach that I use is postpone, inhale, reconsider. It's the old Benson response. Deep breathing, relaxing. Teach your patient how to breathe and how to relax, to close those eyes, to let those arms dangle down by the sides, and to, and to be relaxed several times a day, deep, deep breathing, slowly, two, three times a minute, over five minutes, and bet them 50 cents that they won't need that cigarette. Postpone, inhale, reconsider. Use oral substitutes. And I think that mints, lemon drops, and cinnamons are wonderful. Those are things, iced tea are great. But I don't use the word quit. I don't think that's a word that we should be using, being a quitter. I don't think that that's the kind of thing that we should be talking to people. They're not smokers. They're persons who smoke. I don't believe in setting quit dates. I think they could stop now if they want. I don't expect them to, but I say, why don't you give it a try? We'll, we'll try as many times as it takes. But I don't resort to the pharmacologic property, uh, ch chemicals until I've exhausted all these other. Here's a lady who stopped for her dog. I mean, she, she uh, wouldn't do it for her husband or her kids, but she read in one of her dog uh, journals that, uh, uh, that it was good for the dog. So, you know, it's just a way that we look at how smoking is motivating individuals. And so I wouldn't rely on so simply giving nicotine substitutes. Those are great when you've, you've exhausted your possibilities, but unfortunately they have a very high rate of failure and recidivist rate. They do increase the effectiveness rate, but look what happens when you go and, and prescribe them and when they buy them, they go to the pharmacy and here's Walgreens where they have their smoke buster center right next to the Marlboro Center. And there's even a pharmacy in Milwaukee, Wisconsin called Pill and Puff. I mean, we really need to work at our pharmacy level as well. Talk to your local pharmacist, see if they can help support you in putting those, those cigarettes behind the counter and not up front or even not selling them at all. That's what we need to be getting into as physicians. So to summarize, I think the consumerist model that I've outlined is at no cost. It's a practice builder. It's something that will spread the patients. Hey, he took some time. They'll tell their friends, he, he took some time with me about this. He didn't just give me some drug. It's based on your words, your language. It's not based just on the addiction and the physiology. It's not based on medications. It's based on your having a little laugh with the patient and being on their side. It's above all dealing with attitude and not just with physiology. I think it's a very potent dependence, but it's not a hopeless dependence. And I don't like this notion that it's more addictive than heroin. I don't like to compare things like that because it gives people a defeatist attitude thinking it's much too hard for them to stop. I think we need to individualize each of us to each of these patients. What matters most to those people 
is, is different than it might be to us. What we need to do is to show that we really care. And, and to demythologize those low tar cigarettes and the, the weight loss issue and the stress issue and avoid those words that are negative words and try to use different approaches to, to, uh, to dealing with our patients. Time and caring equals commitment, in my opinion. That's what's going to sell us as good clinicians on smoking cessation. Dr. DeBakey said it simply in an ad he appeared in a few years ago. He watches his weight and he doesn't smoke. Simple as that. Not, not beating him over the head. Uh, he's, he's an exemplar for all of us. And he, he was there. I remember seeing that in one of the airports, and I said, wow, you know, it's a simple message, simply put. Should have been on television all the time. And the medical school went smoke-free. And outside the medical schools, what we need to do is, is keep that message in the community with love, doc, with love from us to all of our patients, even those folks that still smoke.